Hi, it's Robin. It's been one year since I started 8-Bit Show and Tell, so I thought I'd make one of those special episodes. You know, like when TV shows use a bunch of old footage so they don't have to record anything new except everyone sitting around a campfire or something like that. In fact, I'm not even recording my hands right now, I just reused some old footage. Joking aside, I've got two things I'd like to talk about today. A recap of all the episodes from this year, including some unseen parts of my appearance on the 8-Bit Guy, but first, a look at a major source of inspiration for my channel. Now, for the Commodore 64, videotape training with Commodore's foremost authority, Jim Butterfield. Hello, I'm Jim Butterfield, and I'd like to tell you about the Commodore 64. Fourteen exciting sessions on today's hottest selling home computer. Vital, up to date information to inform the novice and intrigue the experienced. This is the Commodore 64 training tape with Jim Butterfield. Jim Butterfield is an absolute legend, especially here in Ontario, Canada, where he helped found the Toronto Pet Users Group, was the associate editor of Compute Magazine, and was a consultant on TV Ontario's fantastic Bits and Bytes show. I got to meet Jim in person several times at the World of Commodore events in Toronto, and he even traveled down to the Chicago Commodore show I attend every year. He always had great stories to share and was an excellent teacher. He passed away in 2007. When I first saw this training tape, which was transferred from VHS by my friend, the late Sid Bolton of the Personal Computer Museum, I was amazed as I didn't even know it existed two hours of Jim Butterfield explaining and teaching about the new Commodore 64 from 1983. In 2018, I had been thinking about starting this channel for several months, but didn't know how I'd go about presenting things. I really wanted to try and recreate the vibe of Jim's video, this style of presentation, but I ran into some roadblocks right away. I don't have a studio with a set. Like most people on YouTube, I don't have camera operators, a lighting crew, sound engineers, or anything like that. And very obviously, I'm not Jim Butterfield. But I did notice that the C64 training tape had lots of close-ups of equipment and Jim's hands are in the shots, pointing away. And rather than heavily scripting all the dialogue and planning each shot, he's clearly ad-libbing much of it, the way a teacher or professor would give a talk from some notes, rather than an actor reciting lines. I realized maybe this approach would work for me. With my videos, I want to capture what it's like to use these computers, what they look like, what they sound like. If I could capture what they feel like and smell like, I'd do that too. The focus for me is on the machines and the experience of using them, of discovering them. I could try to get myself on camera more, but I find talking at the camera takes a lot more preparation and effort from me. I'm certainly not a natural, and I'd rather put that energy into the other elements of making these videos. Really, I'm interested in the details of how things work and why, not just a higher level overview. I understand some viewers want more of a documentary style video, but I find that a heavily scripted show glosses over details that are critically important to me. I try to capture those details, but of course still do my best to keep things moving and not dragging. I just think the journey, the process, is just as important as the end result, maybe even more so. So I'd like to wrap up this section with one of my favorite Butterfield quotes. Don't feel you have to be a programmer. You don't, although sometimes programming can be most of the fun. Why else would somebody stay up until 3 o'clock in the morning cursing and then claim the next day that they had a wonderful time. That's part of what it's about. Check the description below for a link to the Commodore 64 training tape with Jim Butterfield on Sid Bolton's channel. It's a very enjoyable video to watch. And now on to the episode recap from the first year of 8-Bit Show and Tell. I'll keep it to a point or two of behind the scenes info from each of the 39 episodes released before this one. The first three episodes featured my Breadbox C64 in the metal enclosure used in some schools. Commodore 64 Basic All 32 Errors, my very first video, a 48-minute epic showing how to produce every error built into C64 Basic, which went live November 28, 2018. 
I did quite a bit of research for this episode too, because the list that Commodore published in their books of errors was incomplete, and it had some errors in it. The funniest thing about this episode is that I did a premiere of this on YouTube for the first showing, and a bunch of Twitter friends showed up after I promoted it there, and then the show cut out after just a few minutes. The upload somehow failed, but didn't tell me, so that was a really terrible launch. Fortunately, they came back to watch the second time after I successfully uploaded the video. Number two, Commodore 64 Basic, then if optimization and benchmarking. Inspired by my friend Nico's post on Facebook from an old magazine, this is about implementing a short circuiting logic in Commodore 64 Basic by using then if. I didn't even know the term short circuiting when I made the video, but apparently it's commonly used in modern languages. Number three, Classroom Commodore 64 Enclosure and C128D. This was the least popular video on my channel for a long time, until I made a video about Commodore 128 basic debugging commands. In this episode, I decommissioned the metal enclosure I had been using, as I found it too limiting not having easy access to the cartridge port, and introduced the Commodore 128D I used in many episodes afterwards. So in this next batch of videos, I used the Commodore 128D, but mostly just in Commodore 64 mode. Episode 4, The Extra Spaces in Commodore 64 Basic Errors. Another epic 37-minute video I put a lot of research into to explain with ROM disassemblies why the C64 displays extra spaces in its error messages. This is the most downvoted video I've ever made as a percentage. 4% of voters gave it a thumbs down compared to the average about 2% on my channel. I'm not entirely sure why. In these early episodes, I include other segments like new 8-bit stuff, and this episode was even a bit of a Christmas special, so I played my favorite Christmas-themed Atari 2600 game, showed some IRQ-driven snowflakes I had coded, and included my song Commodore 64 Christmas at the end, in which I actually appear on camera singing and playing ukulele. So maybe that's why I got so many downvotes. It's also interesting that it had under a thousand views for the first three months since I uploaded it just before Christmas 2018. And then suddenly in March, it went semi-viral and jumped up to 13,000 views. Not really sure why. Episode 5, Commodore 64 RAM expansion units and SID random numbers. Again, with a long 40-minute video, I covered two subjects for my first video of 2019. First, I showed how to program Commodore's frequently misunderstood RAM expansion units, and then used it to analyze the output of the SID's random number generator. Episode 6, High Density Floppy Disks on Commodore 1541. I was getting tired of seeing people trying to sell high density floppies for use with C64, and specifically with the 1541, and then arguing with people about it on Facebook. So I decided to attempt to make a definitive video about this problem. I've got a couple other controversial topics I want to cover, but still haven't, including why are there so few Commodore 128 native games? And now this is a little bonus here. Early in 2019, David Murray, the 8-bit guy, asked me to record a short video for him to include in his first Dream Computer video, answering two questions. What do I like most about retro computers, and what do I like least about retro computers? I sent him essentially a mini-episode of 8-bit show-and-tell, and he said he'd really like my face to appear on camera, so I shot a new intro for him and sent it back to him. He used some clips from it, but the whole video has never been published, so here it is. Hi, this is Robin from 8-Bit Show & Tell. What I really miss about 8-Bit computers when I'm using modern computers is the immediacy, the full control. For example, you just turn your C64 or 128 on, and you're ready to program in BASIC or play a game, whatever you want to do. It's that single tasking. No, there's no updates to worry about, just the beautiful blue screen, no notifications or pop-ups or anything. So for example, if I just want to program my favorite little one-liner here, and print. Oh, why did I install that Commodore Messenger? I like it just the way it is. 
but what I don't miss about 8-bit computers is trying to use them for productivity tasks. You know those things that your mum or dad actually bought the computer for? Try and do word processing on it. Like here I've got Fleet System 2, the manual for paperclip for the pet, and here's Word Pro 3 Plus for the 64. There was only enough RAM to keep a few pages of text in memory at a time. You could only see 40 columns of text, even though the output was going to be 80. So there's no preview mode. And then there are all the problems the printers themselves had, like configuring it properly. There were no drivers in the operating system. So it was up to every single program to implement drivers for every kind of printer. And on a Commodore, you had devices like the Super Graphics so that you could hook up from your IEC port to a regular Centronics printer interface. These were nice devices in the sense that they're very configurable, but it felt like I was just always messing with these, trying to get the printer to print what I wanted it to. It was doing double lines when I wanted single lines. It would put gaps between all the graphics. I don't miss that at all. Okay, continuing on with the regular episodes. Episode 7, Commerce 64 Assembly Language Programming with Turbo Macro Pro. My first take in an assembly language tutorial on the actual C64 or C128, this went over very well. Just a few lines of code and I went to great detail. It was really important to me to show programming on the real hardware. All the other videos I'd found on YouTube about C64 programming were just using screen capture from emulators with a Windows desktop, and I just found that really boring. Episode 8, more 6510 Commodore 64 programming with Turbo Macro Pro, the sequel. In this follow-up, I got into using the raster register a bit and also talked about non-maskable interrupts. Episode 9, Commodore 64 game programming, keeping score with binary coded decimal. Yet more assembly tutorial. This one was prompted by questions from my friend Darren Folds, who was coding his Invader game at the time and needed a way to display a decimal score in his game. Episode 10, how animated Commodore 64 disk directories work. This video idea was suggested by my friend Jason Compton and it did really well. Pretty sure it was the first video I made that got over 10,000 views and it did it in under a week. Episode 11, exploring Epic's fast load for the Commodore 64. This video also did very well and combined with the previous video, this pushed me past 1,000 subscribers about four months after the channel launched. I had actually hoped that I could hit a thousand subscribers in one year, which is now, uh, so that was really exciting. I've been meaning to do more of these exploring videos, especially one about the Super Snapshot cartridge. Episode 12, Optimizing with Integers in Commodore 64 Basic? This was another semi-controversial topic. I was seeing comments on Facebook and in the comments section of some of my own videos people saying that we should be using integer variables in C64 BASIC as an optimization, but I had learned sometime earlier that that was incorrect. Episode 13, Benchmark by Guitar Tuner? More Commodore 64 BASIC optimization. Kind of a goofy idea, but some of us found it amusing and it sparked a lot of high quality discussion in the comments. Quality comments on YouTube, imagine that. Episode 14, C64 Autoplayer number 2. This very vaguely named episode that was on purpose, this is actually an April Fool's Day video, and it's the second least viewed video I've made. It's actually a demonstration of a real prank ransomware, if I can call it that, C64 program from the 1980s that fooled me when I was a kid. I know the guy who wrote it here in Thunder Bay back in the 80s, and he was really happy I'd recovered it from an old disc I found. It's kind of sad to think how many other interesting programs have been lost over time. So if you have a collection of old discs, look through them and see if you have anything unusual that maybe hasn't been archived yet. Episode 15, even more Commodore 64 basic optimizations. I think we are getting tired of optimizing BASIC by this point, but because of all the great ideas in the comments from the previous BASIC optimization video, I made one last video about the subject. Episode 16, Commodore 64 Quirks, Bugs, and Easter Eggs. This was the first video I made about Easter eggs, secrets, etc., and I guess it won't surprise anyone that got a fair number of views. I love Easter eggs and quirky bugs, and it seems I'm not alone. 
Episode 17, Commodore PC-50-2. I had this Commodore made 386SX PC set up on my table here ever since I was doing prep and research for that high density floppy disk episode quite a time earlier. So I decided to make a video about it so I could just put it away finally. I was able to make it more 8-bit themed by showing a very early C64 emulator that ran really slowly on it. Episode 18, Super Mario Brothers on the Commodore 64 128D with Super CPU. This was the first video I ever made in a real hurry to quickly respond to news of this amazing release. While it wasn't my usual type of video, I was able to add some technical insight based on what I knew of the development of the game, and also to show how the game made good use of the Super CPU. I didn't know it ahead of time, but this game got a lot of fairly mainstream press when Nintendo started requesting takedowns of the C64 game, and some of the articles about the takedown linked to my video about the game. So this is the first video on my channel that went kind of viral, getting about 500 views an hour for extended periods of time, and it wasn't until the vinyl easter egg video just last month that this video finally got knocked off the top of the list for views. Episode 19, Neutron. New Commodore 64 shoot 'em up on NTSC C128D. I was in the middle of research for another big video going deep into basics inner workings when this fantastic shoot 'em up was released. So I made a quick video about it. Episode 20, about Commodore 64 basic abbreviations. This 36 minute video was my first collaboration video, which was with Jeff Burt, where he asked me about how C64 basic abbreviations work, and he recorded a nice little intro for it. Check out his channel, Hey Burt, if you haven't already. Episode 21, making a new Commodore 64 game, Invader. The longest video I've ever made yet, almost 57 minutes, is a discussion with my longtime friend and my sometimes podcast co-host and sometimes my drummer, Darren Folds, about the Commodore 64 game he made over the winter. We discuss many elements of game design and programming and look through his assembly language source code in detail. It's like pair programming on the Commodore 64. Episode 22, Star Trek Technobabble, Commodore 64 Speaks. I discovered a C64 BASIC program I had coded back in the 90s based on Phil Farron's Nitpicker's Guides to Star Trek, and I decided to combine that with a look at two C64 speech synthesizers. Finally, the era of my C128D is over, at least for now, and I did three episodes about the VIC-20. Episode 23, Realms Quest V, the biggest VIC-20 game ever. My friend Gislain Dubois had been working on a huge VIC-20 role-playing game for years and finally finished it, so I both show some gameplay and share details of the game's development. Episode 24, Tiny Text Adventure from ZX81 to VIC-20 to Ultimate 64. A collaboration with my friend Jason Compton, I port an amazing 10-line text adventure from the ZX81 to the VIC-20 in BASIC, and Jason ports it to the C64 in the Zork implementation language. Episode 25, VIC-20 Super Expander Programming Challenge. I answer an interesting programming challenge I found on Twitter with my VIC-20 and the Super Expander cartridge, which adds extra graphics commands to BASIC. And then after that VIC-20 series, I did four videos in a row about the Commodore 128 in 128 mode and used my flat 128 for these episodes. Episode 26, Commodore 128 Secrets, Bugs, and Easter Eggs. Although I had used the C128D for many episodes already, it was usually just in C64 mode, so I kicked off a Commodore 128 mode special with this look at a bunch of weird bugs the C128 shipped with. This video did very well and helped push past 5,000 subscribers. Episode 27, Join the Commodore 128 Escape Club. I was unaware that C128 BASIC had all kinds of useful additions to the screen editor in the form of escape codes, and so were most of the relatively few people that watched this video. No regrets, though. It's fun to learn new stuff like this. Episode 28, C128 BASIC Hack, Playing Digital Samples. 
It turned out that I had misunderstood one of the C128 basic bugs in the earlier video, and once we dug into it deeper, I realized the bug strangely could be used for playing digital samples from Commodore 128 basic. New discoveries in 2019. Episode 29, Debugging C128 basic with Tron, Trap, and more. As of today, this video has the fewest views of any video I've made, including some of the very early failures. I was pretty surprised as I thought these Commodore 128 commands were really interesting. Not even Darren's awesome Tron art was enough to get people watching this one. Episode 30, IRQ Driven SID Playback, Commodore 64 Basic and Machine Language. Finally, a return to the C64 assembly language programming. I was surprised by how popular this video was. I guess just because everyone loves SID music? This episode also shows how to program simple interrupt routines. Episode 31, C64 joystick controlled sprites in assembly and basic. Another tutorial type video. People seem to like seeing both the basic and assembly language versions of code. So I'll try and do that more in the future. I've got the sequel to this video planned out already. I've just got to get it recorded. And then in September, I went down to Chicago to the Vintage Computer Festival, as I basically do every autumn, for some retro computer fun. Episode 32, Vintage Computer Festival Midwest 14 Video Montage Tour. People seem to enjoy this tour, mainly because I simply used a tripod as I wandered around the show floor instead of the typical blurry, shaky, always moving camera work that seems most people who attend these shows upload to YouTube. Episode 33, Vintage Computer Festival Midwest Project Interviews. While I was at VCF Midwest, I did short interviews with six of my friends who were presenting things at the show, including David Murray, the 8-bit guy. I was surprised how few views this video got, but then I noticed that interviews with retro computing legends are surprisingly unpopular on YouTube. For example, Retro Man Cave interviewed the legendary Rob Hubbard a couple weeks ago, and that only got 11,000 views. And Retro Man Cave has like 90,000 subscribers. Again, I'm not complaining, I'm just sometimes surprised what video does well and what video doesn't. And not just on my channel, but when I'm watching uh, the many other YouTube channels that I subscribe to and watch regularly. And now this is the final stretch of videos. More bugs and Easter eggs. Episode 34, C64 Turbo Assembler, 34-year-old bug found and fixed. My friend the Fat Man noticed a weird bug in Turbo Macro Pro and I dug into it and found it went all the way back to 1985's Turbo Assembler. So I located the bug, and then I fixed it as well. This video did surprisingly well and was a real boost after a few videos that had performed poorly. An interesting coincidence was that this was my 34th episode, and it was about a 34-year-old bug. I'll point out that I don't actually number my episodes for the public, but I do track the numbers as I'm editing them in my folder structure, as I collect all the video clips and sound and so on. Episode 35, this is the big one, 35-year-old Easter egg hidden on vinyl. This has had nearly half a million views now, and over the month since I released it, or so, has pushed the channel from about 7,000 subscribers to over 15,000. I was actually worried people wouldn't like this video at all when I launched it, when I was doing stuff with like record players and Christian rock, and I thought this is just going to be... People might hate this, <laughs> so, but uh, you never know until you try, eh? And actually part of the reason I did this video when I did was that it was a 35-year-old Easter egg for episode 35. Episode 36, anti-Microsoft Easter egg hidden in C64 Basic. I wasn't planning on making this. I was trying to finish a video about a 36-year-old Easter egg I discovered that hasn't been made public yet, but I wasn't really totally ready to make that video, so I ended up reading T-Pug newsletters and happened to find this interesting article that was in there. Episode 37, 33-year-old C64 game saved from vinyl. This is a follow-up to the big Prodigal Record Easter Egg video, where I find another C64 program, a, a game this time, on vinyl that hadn't been archived. And it also gave me a chance to address some things I didn't explain very well in the first video. 
Episode 38, Karotika Temporarily Killed My 1541 and Other C64 Scares. This was a video idea I'd had around for quite a while, but I didn't know how to frame it, how to put it together, until I was reminded of several other scares I had with my computer growing up. Episode 39, Exploring My Commodore IEEE 488 Disk Drive Collection. I've had lots of requests to show more of my computer collection, so this is a first attempt to address that. And I finally got a lot of pet computer in episode. So this brings us up to today. What's next for the channel? I'm just going to continue making videos about whatever interests me, which is mainly programming, revealing how things work, Easter eggs, uh, fixing bugs, and then working in parts of my collection whenever it suits. I figure if I'm interested in some of these subjects, then many of you will be as well. So that's the best way to just keep whatever I'm enthusiastic about, and it changes from week to week. I'd like to show more non commodore computers, but I'm not nearly as knowledgeable about them. I have many models of Tandy and Atari computers, a bit of Apple as well, and lots of game consoles. All right, thank you very much for watching, for subscribing, and thank you to my patrons for their support. Check out my Patreon page if you want to help make this channel my full-time job. Please note that there are links in the description to all the episodes I talked about today, and especially that Jim Butterfield training tape. There's a link there to that, so please do check that out if you're interested. Two hours of Jim Butterfield, it's awesome. I hope you didn't find this too self-indulgent or whatever. I was excited about a chance to share a few inside stories and my own reactions to some of these episodes. And also, I would like you to watch them if you find them interesting. Next week, we'll get on to something new. Okay, thanks for watching. We'll talk to you next time.